code in All right, so uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to lecture 14 of quantum computation. So we have covered a, a fair amount of ground. Uh, I think the basics of what a quantum computer is and what it can do, uh, that much at least I've conveyed to you. Um, now, there, of course, uh, computation is all about, well, computing, right? And computing means that you require algorithms, right? So, so we've talked about uh, some one algorithm, which is the teleportation protocol. We've talked about super dense coding. Super dense coding is essentially the inverse of teleportation. Uh, so the, this is the only real algorithm we've talked about so, so far, right? So now, we really need to get into the algorithm part of the of the course, right? So, so today, what I will be talking about is something called the uh, Deutsch Chosa algorithm. Okay, and what this algorithm is about? It's about something known as a known as an oracle. Okay, so oracles uh, uh, were, is, a, is a term from Greek mythology, right? Of course, it's there in every mythology. And uh, in case you are not so familiar with Greek mythology, you might be more familiar with uh, the mythology of the matrix uh, in which there is also an oracle. And uh, the oracle has all the answers. Right, so that, that's, what, that's what a quantum oracle is. It is a black box, uh, which you can give some input and then it can compute uh, the value of some function uh, with that input as its argument and give you an answer, okay? So for instance, uh, the function could be something like, so, so Oracle is something that answers questions basically, right? So for instance, you could have a, you could have a, a, a function that f of x is equal to zero if x is not prime, right? Or one if x is prime. Okay. This is just one example, right? You could you could also uh, so the kind of so this is also a function, right? In this case, this is a function. So, for instance, what is it a function of? Uh, well, it would be a function from the uh, natural numbers to uh, zero and one, right? So. What uh, does a, how do we model such a, uh, some such, fun such a functionality in a quantum circuit, right? So what we need is the following, right? Uh, we need to have some input. So X is our, our input data, okay? And it is encoded in the qubit ket X, right? And this is our black box where U of F is a unitary, right? Which uh, computes this function. And what you get out on the second qubit is this expression, okay? So 
what is this this is xor right what is xor xor is addition if you think in terms of modulo in terms of binary arithmetic it's addition modulo 2 right so 0 plus 0 mod 2 is 0 right One plus zero mod two is equal to zero plus one mod two is equal to one, right? One plus one mod two is zero, right? So this is the truth table for XO. Now, so what uh, we want. Uh, so, so why why are we doing this in the first place, right? Why are we doing this this XOR thing? Okay. Well, the reason is uh, that well, let's ask ourselves uh, what we one what one would need to do uh, if you just had a, a classical oracle, right? So, a classical oracle. would be a well it would be just something of another black box right but which doesn't need to take a qubit it takes a classical value and it outputs a the value of the function okay uh now the thing is that uh we want um we want an oracle this uh, the quantum mechanical version right so if we, if we, if we quantize this so to speak we want to build a circuit so it turns out that whenever you have a classical circuit or some classical logic and you want to make it reversible okay so for instance this black box could represent a classical and gate right and uh, so what is the boolean symbol for and i think it's a uh, it's this if i'm not mistaken x and i'll just write x and right so how how does one uh, convert this right this is a classical and gate how would one make it into a the corresponding quantum mechanical circuit right well what you do is so this is very general and it is shown in again in thomas wong and i'm sure it's shown in many other places uh, and thomas wong let me just give you the reference so you can also look it up section 1.4 that you can take any classical circuit such as this and gate above and make it reversible right so first of all if you want a quantum circuit the quantum circuit has to be reversible right the quantum because a quantum gate is a unitary unitary can go both ways right it has to have an inverse so and probabilities will only be conserved if the circuit is reversible so how do you uh, make something reversible it is by introducing an extra degree of freedom right so in this case what is that degree of freedom it is this this y right so this y you can we can call it our ancilla okay so ancilla means it's auxiliary we can call it or whatever right it's something that 
helps you to do achieve whatever you're trying to achieve so classical circuit and make it reversible by introducing extra degree of freedom right and then what we do is we xor the output of our circuit right this is our classical circuit for instance we xor the output of our classical circuit with the new degree of freedom okay so what what does that mean so for instance if you look again at this and gate now let me um, use variables a and b okay so what i want is i want to make a make a reversible circuit so i introduce an auxiliary degree of freedom okay and then i take the output from my classical logic circuit and i xor it so this is the symbol for xor okay i won't worry too much about uh, the aesthetics i don't know why it's shaped like an onion uh and so this is let's say some function f right and what comes out of here is fab for instance right and so this this is the xor gate and what comes out here is y xor f of x okay and a uh, small error which is that uh we want the circuit to be reversible so that means the number of inputs has to be equal to the number of outputs and what that means is that uh right so you get a b so this is your this is exactly what is happening in this in this circuit here right you have your input variable in the first qubit it's coming out unchanged you have your ancilla qubit which is in the ancilla qubit and this qubit takes on the value of y xor with this function acting on it right so you can see in this case that number of inputs is equal to number of outputs right and this circuit is reversible it can be shown so the corresponding uh, quantum circuit is that well you have some input data let's say you have some variables a1 to an right you have your auxiliary y your unitary acts on so this input state comes out untouched and then what comes out here is y xor the function f acting on whatever your input data okay now as an example uh let's just consider uh what happens for different values of x and different values of y okay and and we'll of course in the following we will uh, we will just reduce our input degrees of number of input degrees of freedom to one okay so we'll just be talking about uh we'll just be talking about this this kind of a circuit 
though this in general that x degree of freedom can be something complicated okay all right so now what happens for different values of of y and x okay so if y is equal to 0 what is this fx x or y right is equal to well you can con convince yourself that it's going to be equal to f of x f of x right and remember f of x is a binary function so f of x it takes values in 0 and 1 right so if f of x is 0 then 0 x or 0 is 0 and if f of x is 1 then 1 x or 0 is 1 right so this is an identity okay this is a identity and similarly if y is equal to 1 uh then fx x or y is equal to the inverse the not of x okay again you can convince yourself that this is this is the case if fx is 1 then 1 x or 1 will give you 0 If f x is zero, then zero x or one will give you one, which is the negation of x. Right? That's what this symbol, the bar symbol, means. I'm just going to pause the recording really quickly. Um, Okay so now let's ask ourselves what happens if for instance your uh, input qubit is in a superposition okay so for instance it's in this state right and we'll take our this or ancilla qubit to be in the in the zero state okay so what is the input the input is so that there, there are there are two possibilities the first possibility is that x and y are both zero like in which case this is the output right and if x is 1 then this is this is the output right and what is fx x or 0 it's just f right so this thing is equal to just f0 this is equal to f1 okay so if you take this unitary and you so so let's just look at this if your input state is 0 0 and what is your this 0 0 what is the order of qubits uh this is your uh data and the second one is your ancilla right so if it is 0 0 your output is 0 f0 and if it's 1 0 your output is One f one. Okay. So then, what is the result of the unitary acting on a superposition? Right. So this is your data qubit, and it's in this superposition. 
well the answer is that you will get a linear combination of these two possibilities right so you will get 0 f0 1 f1 by root 2 right and what is this telling us okay, this is well this is an example of of quantum parallelism in action right because what this is saying is that in order to evaluate my function f on two different values on of x so i want to evaluate my function on 0 and x is equal to 1 i can just run this circuit once right because if my input state is a superposition of 0 and 1 then my output state will be a superposition of the answers right f of 0 and f of 1 and let me just be a little bit more careful uh, in in writing this the in the the unitary acts on this is the input to the unitary right and when i write something like 0 f of 0 i hope you understand that what it means is that okay now now let's uh, how do we get the plus state if you remember we act on the if we act on the hardamard state with a hardamard uh, gate on the zero you get the plus state right okay now what let's do something a little bit more interesting let's take n qubits okay So we have n qubits, okay? And we have the Hardamard acting on each one of these. So what do I get here? I get a superposition by root two. two. So on, right? Okay, so what is my input state? My input state is this, the tensors, zero tensors. Okay? So I can write it as something like this, zero tensor n. What is my output state? My output state is I can write like this, right? And Two to the power n by two. Okay. Now let's just take n is equal to two and evaluate the numerator. For some of you, you might already like see what's going on, but it need not be evident to everybody. So we we'll, we should work it out explicitly. Okay. So for n is equal to two, what is this product state? right what is this this i can write in the following way i can write it as summation of x where x is an integer which goes from 1 to 2 to the n minus 1 
right so this one will be x is equal to 0 1 2 and 3 right so if you want to create a symmetric superposition of all the computational basis states right so this is for two for a two qubit system how many basis states are there there are four of them and this is a equal weight superposition of all the basis states what do you do you take the inputs in the zero states, you put each one through a harder mark. Oops. And the output state that you get is an equally weighted superposition of all the computational bits. So you can convince yourself that, well, if n is equal to three, right, the You should write it as this tensor three. This will be zero, 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 one. Right? All the possible combinations. One. And so I can write it as summation of x is from one to seven. Like this, right? So there will be a uh, root eight in the denominator also. Right? Yeah, no, that I have put over here. No? Okay. Oops. Yeah. Now, so let's say our function f of x is something which uh, takes n bits. Okay. So f of x, we have function f of x where uh, x. is an n n bit variable okay so that's what this notation means right? you're taking n values from this from this set and our function is a binary function on this set right so it gives us a zero one So how do we how do we go about uh, constructing our our circuit? We start with zero tensor n. We put a harder mod on each one of these. What do we get? We get summation of x. 1 to 2 n minus 1, right? This becomes our input state. And then we have our ancilla qubit over here. Y, right? And our input state comes out on the other end unchanged. This is a unitary. And we get y x or f of x. Well, not f of x, my bad. I, have to, I should be careful. We get y, we get sum over x from 1 go to the n minus one and y xor f of x and uh, this factor of uh, uh, two to the minus n by two let me not let me not forget that okay that is also important Okay. Now, 
if if y is equal to zero, right? Uh, then, so what is okay? Well, we can now we can talk about Deutsch's algorithm. So, what is Deutsch's algorithm, or the Deutsch Deutsch algorithm? Well, the goal of this algorithm was not really to do something practical. but it was a means of showing that there is some classical problem for which the quantum uh, solution is provably faster than any classical solution okay so this you you can attempt at showing theoretical quantum supremacy or quantum advantage okay so the initial algorithms which 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 emerged in the early days were not really very useful like as far as allowing us to compute things and then there was a refinement of this which was called the bernstein was zirani algorithm and then there was a refinement of that which is called simons algorithm so all of these were trying to establish the fact that there is a quantum advantage and you have to keep in mind that all of this was done in the 80s and early 90s and in those days uh if you said that you were working or doing research in quantum quantum computation people would look at you uh a funny right people would like think that you you are nuts uh, because even if even if quantum this this whole idea of quantum computation has any meaning at all of course it will never be possible right in the real world so their job was just to establish okay well if we can get something to behave well if we can get qubits to behave well so on at least theoretically there is some basis for quantum computation right then the first real practical algorithm was shor's algorithm okay which which involves there are a couple of different algorithms that shor gave one was about factorization um and another was um about error correction so we'll come to those in a later point but i'm just trying to tell you what uh, what is the relevance of of all of these now the goal of this of the deutsch algorithm is the following is that if you are given a function of n bits okay so this is a function of n bits a uh, a boolean function of n bits then there are two kinds of functions well there are many many infinite number of kinds of functions but broadly speaking there are two kinds uh which are known as uh what is it a constant or a balanced function so a constant function of course you can tell from the from the terminology it's 
it's just a function which gives for which f is the same for every combination of your bit and a balanced function is one in which your function gives zero for one half of the possible inputs and one for one half of for the other half of the possible inputs so if you were to make a make a make a plot of a constant function right it wouldn't look very very interesting this would be a constant function this would be a constant function right either you get all zeros or all ones a balanced function on the other hand right is something for which you have an equal number of zeros and ones right but the problem is that you don't know you don't know uh which how how they are distributed right so the question is the question that we are asking is a question which comes under the what is known as query complexity right which so so classically if you want to determine whether a function is is constant how many queries do you need to be sure brute force you need to check every single input right because it is possible that on the last possible input the so the function is the same on all the inputs except for the last one where it suddenly changes so in the worst case scenario you need uh 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 trial to to confirm that f of x is constant right now okay so of course this is a this is in the in the case that you want a deterministic answer but if you are only if you are happy to be satisfied with a probabilistic answer then your algorithms can do much better okay so if you have a classical probabilistic algorithm so a prob ballistic algorithm it can easily outperform the quantum circuit implementation okay so that is the reason that this doyle georgia algorithm is not really like so relevant it is relevant for the reason that it demonstrates that the quantum version is probably efficient compared to the deterministic solution okay and uh, coming back to this query complexity what is the uh, minimum number of queries you need to establish that a that a function is um uh, is balanced well again uh, in the worst case scenario uh, you need you need to check every input right because it is possible uh, that your output could be like this you get a 1 then a 0 then a 1 then a 0 then a 1 then a 0 right this goes on until you get to the last qubit 
right? Where you think that it's going to be again going to zero, but it doesn't. It's again a one. Okay. So how how does this does this work? It works as follows. We start with we start with this circuit okay and we take this ancilla qubit to be in the in the one state okay so what happens when we when we do that well let's look at our input state again so our input state at the very beginning is 0 tensor n right and then 1 so this is your input and this is your ancilla okay now we apply uh, a hardamard gate to each qubit okay, as shown here so what is so i'll call this uh, i'll call this psi 0 so psi 1 we obtain by taking n copies of Hardamard and identity on the ancilla and acting on psi naught. Okay. So what do we get? We get. Let me uh, let me write down the the answer and then I will explain to you how we get that. we get the following um, one second ha ah, sorry 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 the hardamard acts on each qubit on all the qubits it it acts on the ancilla also my mistake so you have a hardamard it acts one acting on every single qubit and so what is your output state? Your output state is this zero plus one tensor N. And now the Hardamard acting on your input state, right? This is your input state. The Hardamard acting on this gives you zero minus one, right? It gives you the minus state. And then the whole thing divided by uh, root of uh two n plus one by two okay so this expression can be written as follows using the notation that we that we built earlier it can be written as x and then tensor zero minus one and then one by Right, so here we have used the notation that uh, I introduced to you a little bit earlier. So now we apply our oracle, right? So we apply the oracle to psi one, which gives us psi two. And then what is the output? X is equal to one to n minus one, right? So when you have X um, and zero, your, your output is F of X, X or zero. And otherwise it is F of X, X or one, right? Now, 
f of x x or zero. This is equal to f of x. Okay. F of x x or one is equal to the negation of x. Okay, and now we can write this and another way, which is the following. We can write it as minus one to the power f of x x. Ah yes, I forgot to put an x over here. And zero. Okay. And now you are thinking, well, what's what's going on? You have to keep in mind that f of x is a binary function. So f of x can either be zero or one. Right. Uh, Vineet, if you don't mind, uh, you can turn your video off because you are rotating a lot. And nice. um, <laughs> so it's a little distracting. Yeah, it was involuntary. Sorry. Uh, no, maybe maybe you all you have already like gone over this material and you're familiar. With okay. So the question is, how did we get from uh, this line? How do we get from this line to this line, right? So you have to keep in mind that f of x is a binary function. So you can consider the various possibilities that if f of x is zero, right? Then what happens? You get f of x, x or zero, which is what? Which is zero, right? For the first term, if f of x is one, then f of x x or zero is equal to one, right? And similarly for the second term, for the second term in this sum, what do you get? So for the second term, you get f of x x or one, right? And what is zero x or one? This is one. You get f of x, x or one. One x or one is zero, right? So there are two possibilities. One possibility is that f of x is zero. If f of x is zero, then u of f acting on psi one, what does it give me? It gives me one by root two n plus one, this, etc. x, times zero minus one, right? If f of x is zero. And otherwise what it gives me, all of this is the same, right? It gives me one minus zero. If f of x is equal to one, right? This second expression, this second expression, I can write as minus one to the power f of x, right? Times zero minus one, right? And this expression covers both the cases because when fx is zero, minus one to the power f of x is, is one. And when f of x is one, minus one to the power f of x is minus one. So both of the cases are covered in this, right? So we get, we get the following result. We start with our We start with our n n qubits. We put a harder mod on each of the each one of the qubits. And on the ancilla qubit. 
right? And this is our input state, our input data. It comes out unchanged over here. And then this output is uh, one by root of two n plus one summation of x. Uh, so, right, I mean, well, you have to consider the full thing. You can't just consider, you can't just consider one part of it, right? So the full state becomes one by root of two and plus one summation of X minus one to the F of X, X. Okay. All right, so so what what have we uh, what do we gain in this process? Right. So so this is this is what we get if our input bits. So so for which value of x are we evaluating this? Okay. So for which value? For what sequence of bits? Remember that we started out with all the bits in the zero, right? But it is giving us, the final answer is giving us a superposition of all the possible answers, right? Now, Um, okay, one second. Okay. Now at this stage, we apply us another set of harder mods. So we have psi three, right? So this was psi zero. This was psi one. This was psi two. And then we have one more step, which is psi three. And psi three is the following, is that you take this harder mod and now you apply this harder mod only on the, on the data qubits, okay? And then after doing this, you measure all of the data qubits. Now, I'm going to write down something, which again will, you will probably be left wondering like, well, how did this happen? But let me write it down first. So after applying this harder mod, Right, so we are applying this harder mod on this on this expression now. Okay. What are we left with? We are left with minus one f of x. We get another summation in this in this. Okay. Where is this summation coming from? Because see, you have to remember that in this expression over here, right? In this expression for psi two, what is a single X? A single X is a sequence of bits, right? So what is X? It's, it's some, sequence of bits it which can be which is all all the possible bit sequences right 
the 2n minus 1 bit sequence right now when you start out at the very beginning at the very beginning you start out with a single bit sequence the 0 0 all zero bit sequence you apply hardamard to that when you apply hardamard to that what do you end up with right when you apply hardamard to that well where is it where is it where is it you end up with with this expression you end up with an equal weight superposition of all the bit sequences okay so starting from the zero bit sequence you end up with a equal weight superposition of all bit sequences now what i am saying is that we again apply this hardamard or n copies of this hardamard gate to this equal weight superposition right so schematically one can under one can view this as follows that if you start from this 0 0 state right and you apply the hardamard what do you end up with you end up with an equal weight superposition of all possible bit strings right but now the next step is that we apply a hardamard to each one of these we apply a hardamard to the whole whole state right we apply a hardamard to this whole expression which is a linear superposition which means we are applying a hardamard to each one of these each one of these terms in this superposition and when we apply a hardamard to each one of these terms in this superposition right what happens you get another superposition right where again there are n n states over here right n n terms in the superposition n n n right so the first hardamard is what gives you the summation over x the first summation x is equal to 1 x is equal to 0 to 2 n minus 1 and then the second hardamard the second hardamard is what gives you the second summation from y is equal to 0 to 2 n minus 1 okay it takes a little bit of time to wrap your head around this but now the really tricky part which is well i have yet to wrap my head around it <laughs> is the following right so even if you understand what's going on here great wonderful we have understood this minus 1 f of x we have understood where this summation comes from we have understood where this summation comes from right but now the tricky part is figuring out what happens when you apply the hardamard to an arbitrary bit string and the answer is this where in this expression you have this minus 1 to the power x y okay now what is x dot y x dot y is the dot product but it is the sum of the bit wise dot product like this right what are x and y remember x and y are both n bit strings right so x is equal to some combination of zeros and ones and y is equal to some combination of zeros and ones okay so x dot y 
is going to be what? x dot y is going to be 1 x or 0 x or 1 x or 0 sorry no not 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 0 is the is the product so let me again be a little bit careful about that so the product of 0 and 1 is 0 0 0 and then 1 and then 0 and then you take the XOR of all of these. Okay. So this looks like something uh, terribly complicated. So this is your final state after you have uh, performed the two sets of Hardamards and your ancilla with the x or with the f of x and everything uh, sir uh, have you missed a cat x somewhere um well no because we are talking about uh, yeah okay maybe you're right i have missed a, missed something here one second let me just check um No, I, 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 okay, yeah, so there's a small mistake here, which is that uh, this is only acting on the state of the first register, right? The, the second set of harder mods is not acting on the ancilla. It's only acting on the set of the first, first register. And so you can write, um, you can write that expression as as this sum. Now, if you if we take a look at this expression, so this is our state on the of the data register. Okay. This is the state of our data register. Now, we, we perform a measurement of these n, n qubits, right? Not the ancilla, these, these n qubits. Okay, and we ask what is the probability of measuring the output state to be in the in the ground state right the vacuum zero 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 and we can read off the probability by looking at this expression right so what is this probability going to be this probability is going to be this zero tensor n in a product with psi phi, right? And squared. So when you take this inner product, what will happen? you have to take this inner product with the all the possible y states 
but this will be zero unless y is equal to the zero con the, the vacuum state right and so your sum over here this this sum will collapse to a single term okay and what will happen to this x dot y you can convince yourself that x dot y um is equal to zero if y is equal to zero i mean i mean it's true because well that's what the dot wise product if y is all zeros each of the bit wise product is zeros and then adding all of those up modulo 2 gives you zero so the probability of this this probability is the amplitude uh the coefficient of this state squared right so what is the coefficient we are left with the coefficient we are left with is the following minus 1 f of x right squared because in this expression if you set y to be the zero state then you are left with only one term and that term corresponds to now here's the thing right that f if f of x is balanced then what is this sum going to be this sum is going to be zero and then if f of x is constant right why is it zero because balance means that you have an equal number of zeros and ones right and so minus 1 to the power 0 gives you 0 minus 1 to the power 1 gives you 1 minus 1 right so you get 1 minus 1 1 minus 1 minus 1 and if it's balanced that will all add up to 0 and if it's constant that means all the fx values are equal they are all zero or they are all all one right and so in that case this divided by 2 to the n will be equal to 1 or at least the the modulus squared right so this circuit you run this circuit once right and you perform a measurement on your data qubits right and you measure uh, the probability that your state is that your final state is in the ground state okay if you get one which means that yes it is in the ground state that means your function was constant and if you get zero then that means your function was balanced right and i realize that this is not super transparent as to what is going on here one of the main uh, issues that well people will have difficulty with is understanding where do you get this where does this suddenly pop out from and for this uh, purpose it, it is actually well you have to sit down and do a little bit of arithmetic and boolean algebra okay so this is this is an example of of a quantum circuit which requires only one query right to determine whether your function is 
is balanced or uh, constant now the thing is that well that's not strictly true um but you can you can show that the number of queries required is linear in n so you so how do you get these probabilities do you get them um from one run no right you have you have to take several runs that's how you'll get a probability distribution right so you perform build this circuit and then you run it several times the question is how many times you need to run it before you can be convinced that f of x is balanced or f of x is constant right and the answer is that you have to run it something like n times whereas in the classical case right in the worst case scenario you have to perform 2 to the n minus 1 plus 1 queries to determine if f of x is constant now this isn't really uh again that big of a deal the reason is because sure you have to run this circuit only only n times or so but look at the complexity right look at the complexity of this whole setup you have to create n qubits n plus 1 qubits you have to apply a hardamard to the first n qubits to each one of them then you have to apply some uh this thing this unitary operator to those n plus 1 that 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 big state of n plus 1 qubits and then you have to again apply a hardamard on the first n qubits on each one of those n qubits and then you have to measure each one of the n qubits right so for you know if you know if 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 you are not doing the one making the experiment and doing the measurement it's easy to say okay that's just a single query but a single query involves a hell of a lot of work right whereas the classical computation of f of x is almost trivial it's just you have you just have to look it up in some in some table right so that is one reason why uh, this algorithm is not particularly uh, you know it doesn't tell us great deal about the power of quantum computation okay so what we will be looking at in the coming classes is we'll be looking at uh the what is called the quantum fourier transform and then uh this will lead us to something called quantum phase estimation and this will lead us to shor's algorithm and finally to grover's algorithm so grover's algorithm is something that i talked about i think in one of the earlier classes right and it is something that is actually very practically very useful right though again the present status of the implementation of these algorithms is still very very in much in its infancy but these uh this is this is what the world of quantum com computation is being built upon so you know if you want to get a foothold into that world it is to understand these algorithms okay all right well i'll stop now thank you for your time and again as usual i've gone uh, well over
the time limit okay so i'll stop here and see if you have any questions so are we applying the hardmat gate to the ancilla as well i mean in one of the diagrams you have yeah done. yeah in 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 that's right that's right you're right in uh, in the preparation stage we are so here we have to apply a hardmat so in this in this circuit right so i have a hardmat here on the ancilla oops what happened i have a harder model here right okay yes sir question so the n bits which you are considering the uh, ancilla is also included in that no so so the n bits are the are the they are my input they are my arguments to my function then my ancilla is an is a separate degree of freedom i'm not sure what your whether that answers your question or what your question was can you yes, maybe i i understand okay and now also please keep in mind that uh the all of this looks looks terribly complicated but when it was first worked out by by these people right doich and josta and so on right nobody stumbled upon this expression right away right the process they must have followed is to look at simple examples right so what happens if for instance you what is the what is the simplest non trivial example is when you have two two bits right so in that case you sit down and work it out and you see what happens right and then that the final expression so and then you build up from that right and then you are like well how do i collect all these terms i'm getting some some phases here of minus 1 what pattern is there in those phases right and then and then some friend of yours who's uh, quite smart with uh, boolean algebra he points out that well maybe you can use this uh, bitwise sum and uh, you're like okay and that, and that allows you to generalize it to uh the n n variable case right so you have to remember this is this is the final product of a lot of uh of a you know long thought process of experimentation okay so if you are having some if you are having difficulty understanding it that's okay <laughs> that's perfectly okay and and if you want to really understand it what you have to do is you have to work out the simple example and so you can look either in the qis kit book or you can look in thomas wong um or nielsen and chuang where simple examples are worked out okay you understand anything only by looking at and at examples right so like when you first learn multiplication tables right they also look very arbitrary to you right when you say two ones are two two twos are four as a as a child this looks very very arbitrary and strange to you right but then you start to see a pattern and what is the pattern is that each time you are going up by number 2 right and the moment you see this pattern then all the multiplication tables fall into place right because you realize that if i take p ones are 
is P and in P one or two is what? It's two P, right? And then multiplication clicks. But you don't understand it the first time. If if somebody just told you that okay, that if the product of two numbers, right, is this. Looking at this expression, uh, if you if you had no idea what multiplication meant, you would be completely lost, right? So again, if you want to understand it, you have to look at the pattern, okay? Yeah, and the pattern of simple cases. Okay. Any questions? Otherwise, if not, then I guess I'll stop the recording.